for the artists, for the passionate. Welcome to the Adventures Elsewhere podcast. Hello everyone and welcome back to the Adventures Elsewhere podcast. I am your host, Jay Black, and today I'm doing a part of, we don't know what order this series is going to be <laughs> released in because me, um, a little sort of sub-mini-series on emotions. And what I've done with this is I've taken a philosophy that I don't really agree with at all in acting about the sort of five core emotions and... I've swapped one out for what it's worth, but made that into the sort of template for this. And I may or may not to do some more specific episodes on particular emotions. So things like stress is one I don't have that I've thought about doing. So make sure you keep your eyes peeled for that. And because this is somewhat of a more craft-based episode, though not really... I will just start off by saying I'm not here to give writing advice, as always. I'm just here to talk about my craft, my process, what works for me, all of that. So without further ado, let's get into this. Um, hmm, where do we start? Let's start here and talk about the sort of fear of combat, be that physical altercations or arguments, because... That is also a real thing that a lot of people do have. And Harry kind of has both of these. When it comes to arguing, I think there is somewhat of a thing with loud noises. He doesn't like hearing people shouting. That really bugs him. I think there might be, I genuinely don't know, there might be some past trauma here for him that particularly bugs him on that one. But the idea of having a lot of people in a room who are angry with each other or deeply upset with each other as a notion, that bothers Haru. He doesn't like that. I think Haru does have a bit of a fear of angry people as well, which does again tie into the his sort of thing with physical confrontation as well, because Haru has never held a weapon in his life, and he doesn't know unarmed combat, and he's five foot nothing. <laughs> so, you know, if Haru gets into a fight with somebody, he's not going to come off well, is the long and short of it, and he's very, very aware of it, and it does play on his mind, at least a couple of times on page. It's been a while since I looked at Miss Nakagami, so I can't say exactly. But. It does bother him, and funnily enough, it that actually doesn't bother him as much as it bothers Hanzo. Hanzo has a much bigger issue with physical altercation. And this is because... I mean, Hanzo is taller than Haru. He's five foot three, but like he is scrawny. The man is not... He's probably physically weaker than Haru is. It would surprise me if he was stronger. Let's put it that way. And Hanzo does have a tanto, and he does keep one in his desk, but he doesn't know how to use it, really. Besides, it's he has it in the sense of, okay, but if I really needed to stab somebody, if I really, really needed to, then I could. And that's kind of where it ends, in terms of actually fighting with it, he's not really got a chance. And given some things I won't get into because of spoilers, but Hanzo's sort of health and how fragile he proves himself to be, the idea of him getting in a fight is <laughs> not good. He is definitely not going to come off well from that. So somewhat related to this sort of collation of combat, we're going to get on to a uh, fear of soldiers in particular. And what I mean by this is not just necessarily 
the sight of soldiers or being around them, but also just the idea of them and their presence. Because in Hukai, little bit of history for you, like everybody accepts that soldiers are a necessity. I mean, Hukai, you know, in history, even before the main war that I've alluded to many a time, they have survived a genocide as a nation. Like that is a thing that happened not all that long ago. <laughs> so nobody questions the necessity of soldiers, but somebody like Coney in particular, the idea of them terrifies him. And this is partly a thing with Coney and authority, though we'll get into that later. It's more to him of this is someone who's just like much bigger and stronger and probably smarter and just in every way more capable than him. And if he makes a mistake, they're going to get really angry with him. Coney definitely has a thing with people who are angry. And it just, it petrifies him. It really, really does. That notion of someone who's bigger and stronger and angrier and everything than him, he really doesn't like it even as an idea, being around a soldier, like, he... <laughs> I, I feel for the guy. Like, if he was actually being interrogated by a soldier, he'd just, like, immediately burst into tears. He, just, he couldn't possibly deal with that. Isamu is kind of in a weird spot on this list, because, like, the idea of soldiers doesn't really bother him, and being around off-duty soldiers or veterans doesn't bother him. It's more if he sees an armed soldier, he's like, okay, this ain't good. Which is more of um probably a reflection on just, you know, having lived through a war is kind of the okay, so some shit's about to go down and people are gonna die and that might well include me. Because <laughs> it's Samu and Death. <laughs> Oy, that's not a subject we're gonna get into because that's honestly an episode of <laughs> of itself, potentially. That is actually an episode I could do about character attitudes towards death. It's, yeah, I might do that. But yeah, the idea of being around armed soldiers, Isamu does not like that. Which is, I think, partially because he's done some things <clears throat> in his backstory that are a little bit legally dubious, and again, he does not have a choice about in the matter at all. Like, he had to do these things, but... I mean, honestly, when push comes to shove with the things he did, you probably wouldn't get anything other than a slap on the wrist. He's just a bit paranoid about it, which again, given his history that I especially can't get into now with a project I've just taken up, Hanzo's also in a weird place on this one. Because, the idea, again, the idea of soldiers doesn't bother him. He actually quite likes the idea. But when he, again, it's the sort of when you see an armed soldier, for Hanzo, especially given all the shit that he's done, it's like, okay, but is this person on my side or are they coming to, like, murder me? <laughs> and he, he doesn't. He's not going to know the answer to that at a glance. Like, he's going to probably assume that they're on his side, but there's always that little voice in the back of your head that goes, yeah, are they though? Is that really what's happening here? And again, there is the... Some soldiers do have a reputation for being hot-headed, and then that's, okay, but if this guy punches me, I'm probably just straight out dead. <laughs> I'm that fragile. So keeping on this sort of similar thread here, I'm going to talk about sort of fear of sort of gore, whether that be just blood or more severe injuries. I'm not going to get into graphic detail, so if you're bothered by that, don't worry about it. But yeah, I mean, this is something that does come up a fair bit in Miss Nakagami, because Haru does not like blood. Whether it's an active fear or not, questionable, don't know, don't care, to be honest. But, um, he doesn't like blood. He always looks away as soon as blood. He's like, no, no, I can't deal with that. If there was anything, like, at all 
more severe that he had to properly witness, be that like a bone breaking through the skin or something, he would probably faint. He he couldn't cope, poor baby. He he just he couldn't deal with that at all. He would genuinely probably be traumatized. At sushi, Haru's dad is slightly better, so blood doesn't bother at sushi that much, unless there's a lot of it, in which case it bothers him, which is completely fair. Again, sort of minor injuries don't really bother at sushi at all. I mean, that's part of, you know, being a parent <laughs> in that, and you kind of have to deal with some things there. But any ki anything kind of moderate or more severe, he gets very, very scared very, very quickly, which again, given history, I'm not going to get into because spoilers makes a lot of sense for someone like him. I don't know whether it's so much of the fear of the, like, gore or injury itself, or whether it's a sort of fear of the lasting consequences of that, of is this person going to be okay, whether that be death or just, like, continued struggle because he's such a caring person, either one of those really bothers him. I don't know which one of those is more prevalent, or whether it's even, or... And then a character I'm not convinced I've ever mentioned on this podcast is Prince Sebastian Rome of Liera. He is King Rome's... Well, he's not his eighth kid, is he? But he's eighth in line. I'm not exactly sure which number kid he is. There are way too many Liera and princes and princesses to keep track of. Like, it's impossible. But, um, anyhow, Sebastian who is, for what it's worth, a smidge younger than Haru. He's not great with gore either. I mean, there is a whole being a prince thing with that, because he's not the warrior prince in the way that Curtis is. He's much more of the I-do-paperwork sort of prince. And, you know, schmooze-with-people type prince. So... He's a bit closer to Haru than at Sushi. Blood? No thanks. He's not going anywhere near that. I mean, I suspect he actually has a legitimate thing with blood, where if he sees more than, like, three drops of blood, he would probably, like, faint. So, you know, be careful shaving, mate. <laughs> Wouldn't be surprised if as soon as he started getting shaky hands as he got older, he'd just like, okay, I'm just having a beard now. And now, to move on from the sort of gore side of things, let's talk about medicine. And whether this be, you know, this is a bit of a broader character category, I can speak. Um, this covers sort of fear of, you know, hospitals and doctors, you know, surgery and medical implements, and also, I guess, medicines and side effects and things like that. So this one's a bit broader. And top of the list for this one, without a doubt, and this is for very spoilery reasons I can't get into, is Hanzo. He he doesn't like hospitals, one bit. He doesn't like anything to do with, like, any part of surgery or any of the instruments or anything. He He doesn't want to be anywhere near any of that. Like, he will pretty much have a panic attack upon seeing that stuff. If he has to go into a hospital, like, if he had to go into a hospital alone, he would barely manage it. Like, it's that bad for him. And when it comes to things like scalpels and knives and things that are used in surgery, like, Hanzo doesn't have proper knives at home. He has, like, tiny diddly little things because that's all he can deal with. Let me get into I, because it might be a bit of a weird shout for someone who is a soldier and has medical training to have a bit of an issue with the medicine side of things, but he does. He isn't the biggest... It's not the actual surgery or things like that that scare him anybody, anything more than it would for anybody else. Like, the whole idea of, you know being put under for major surgery is a little bit scary, but, I mean, that's human, really. So uh, that, to me, doesn't count. He does have a bit of an issue with prescribed medication, though. 
he has been known several times to if he's been prescribed painkillers to just not take them because he he really worries about being addicted to painkillers because he's seen veterans drink themselves to death or you know have other addiction issues and he's like yeah i i don't want that <laughs> thanks and that is a thing for i from a very young age i think prescribed medication he just kind of he, he doesn't do that whether it would if he had a prescribed medication he really needed that would be different, especially if he was he could be one hundred percent convinced it wasn't addictive. That would be a little bit different, but yeah. Tony's another one who falls into this category, and he doesn't have an issue with hospitals themselves or anything. What he has an issue with is um anesthetic like being put under that terrifies him because the issue he has is he doesn't know how much time has passed or anything like that and that bugs him and later on later on in the timeline he does develop a bit of a fear of doctors because Coney does have some legitimately like really scary health issues that I can't get into because spoilers and shit but um if a doctor's coming to see him <laughs> that's not going to be a good thing. And that, again, is that a fear of himself and his health, or is that a fear of doctors? I don't know, but I'm putting that in the same category, so whatever. No oh boy, I guess this is going to be a chunk of an episode. We're reaching 20 minutes already. Um, so, now we've done all of that thread, let's change track a little bit. And talk about sort of loss, I guess. Be that, again, loss of home or loved ones or anything like that. So fear of loss is something that affects a lot of my characters. So I, Nagashima, definitely has this. He definitely has a fear of losing those he loves. I is not proud of the fact that he gets very attached to people very quickly. It is something he has very little control over. He does his best to not do that, but it's that's just him. That's just who he is. And so the thought of losing somebody is really quite difficult for him, especially when there aren't that many people that he really feels that close to. So losing just one of those people would be a huge blow to him. And Curtis is very much the same. Though he doesn't have many people. He doesn't get attached to people super, super quickly. With him, it's actually the opposite. It can take him a really long time. I mean, there is one exception, but... Spoilers, I guess? But Curtis, again, the, again, that fear of losing people, especially because... How do I say this without spoilers? But um, there is someone who is forced away from him to sort of teach him a lesson at a young age. And that that always comes into his mind. And it, it, can't, it didn't do good things to him. I mean, he was what? I'm not convinced he was even 14 then, so yeah. <laughs> there are some really shitty people in the determined ones. I mean, Haru does also very much have this fear of loss. I don't know whether Haru has a straight up fear of death in the same way, because I and Curtis don't really have that. I suspect Haru does at least a bit. He doesn't think about it, he doesn't want to think about it, and the idea of losing somebody and that being very very final to him he doesn't again this is somewhat related to past trauma I, it's not really a spoiler for me to say haru did lose a family member when he was 13 that he was very close to and i while he did recover 
from that to an extent like that trauma is never gonna leave him like not even close like he's not the same after that not that we see that on page for what it's worth Shinichi, when it comes to loss, he would very, very strongly deny that he has this at all. But Shinichi does have a bit of a thing with death. He does... It does scare him, at least a bit. And, again, like many of my characters, he doesn't have many people he's close to. So, again, losing those people because Shinichi doesn't do very well on his own either. That's really, really terrifying to him. And Shinichi does also have the losing his home fear as well, in a way that the other three I've talked about so far don't, because there were times where he didn't have a home, and he didn't really have anything and obviously that's not a good time for him, that's not a time he wants to revisit. And this is exactly the same for both Isamu and Kony, they both had these moments as well. Well, Isamu slightly tenuous, it's not exactly clear what happened there, at least not yet. I might find that out in proper detail soon, but I don't know. But Isamu for a good while actually had a constant fear of losing his home and it obviously was horrible for him and it didn't do him any good and the thought of going back to that point is horrible. Kony actively didn't have a home for quite a long time and again like he like nearly died because of it because he got really really ill and it is something that does actively come up on page in Panstamon in a very uncomfortable moment that was actually really quite difficult to write that spurs him to do something very drastic. Like, the whole scene is just so uncomfortable. And I really wish I could talk about it, but it's huge spoilers. It is actually a real driving force late on in Panstamon, though. So this sort of fear of rejection is what I want to talk about next. And I'm not talking about, you know, being rejected for a date or anything like that. That's not the track I'm going with. What I'm talking about here is sort of rejection by society or by people you thought were friends and family. That sort of happy subject. <laughs> Say that on the podcast episode about fear, like that's a happy subject. <laughs> anyway. To get to the point, rejection is like number... Kony is number one on that list, absolutely. Rejection by society and by friends and family and things like that. That is something that absolutely terrifies him because, again, he's had that. And what that meant for him was being homeless and nearly dying. So he is a people pleaser. I think it's fair to say, at least to some sort of extent, though he does also... He does do some things that kind of defy that, but I think that's Ai Negashima's influence on him. But by nature, Kony is definitely a people pleaser, and that's why, because rejection to him means death, basically, and that's not just because of the way laws are in Hukai. It's a bit more than that for him. Curtis does also very much have a fear of rejection, but this is for very different reasons, being, you know, part of the monarchy of Malasan, being like the only heir. If he is rejected by those within the castle or by the public, uh, that is called a civil war. And the only person to blame for that would be him. And given he has a duty to the people of Malasal to, like, keep them safe and everything. Yeah, that's a pretty terrifying thought to him. Especially given that Malasal have already been through two civil wars. And they 
it was not fun for anybody involved. And obviously Curtis wasn't alive for that, and that's well before his time, but still. It's kind of not the point. And Simon does also have this fear of rejection by society, but this is also... This is for him, again, for a different reason. This is more of a commercial standpoint, because Samu is a musician, he's an artist in that way, so that intrinsic fear of people, like, thinking that's not good, like, they don't like his music, they don't like his art, like, that's... And as any writer or creative will tell you, in any form, that's... It is legitimately scary. I think he has that maybe a bit more than other people in a certain way, because money is difficult with Osamu, and one of the ways he tries to help with that is by, you know, doing things musically. So if that doesn't work, that could be a really big issue for him, and that, again, plays into past trauma and shit. Haru, with his sort of fear of societal rejection and family rejection, is more that Haru is a sociable person. And I think Hanzo really is the same on this one. They actually, I think it's safe to put them together here. They're both social people. Like, Hanzo, it might not seem like it because he lives alone. He doesn't necessarily get out all that much. But they like being around other people. And if they're objective, they, they get a lot out of that. They kind of need that. So then if people don't want to be around them, that's difficult for them. And with them, what that also potentially means is also death. So yay, we love that. The slightly different track again is sort of like fear of time, and this can be passage of time or just the overall nature of time that sort of deal is what I'm going on about and this is definitely a thing for Kone late on for him and again this is for very spoilery reasons but for him the passage of time well, I mean, I think there are quite a few people that have, you know, the passage of time eventually leads to death, but for Kony it's a lot more pronounced because of his health issues, is the long and short of it. And so he he does wake up, like, every day thinking, okay, but am I going to make it to tomorrow? <laughs> that is kind of his thing. And Hanzo does have this a little bit as well, but... It's not the same for Hanzo because he knows the likelihood of him... Hanzo knows the likelihood of keeling over for him isn't all that high. Kony, the likelihood of him just keeling over on any given day is not slim. I think the only other person really who has a legitimate fear of time passing is Helga. And this is because Beneath the Moon as a project is very much on the clock. It's very much about, we only have a certain amount of time. Like, we have to do this thing before the enemy do it first, or we're all, like, dead. Like, proper dead, dead. And so for Helga, that sort of, that passage of time, it's not really a thing for her until then. But at that point, it's like, okay, if I don't get this shit done and nobody else is rushing, like, we're all, like, this is a genocide. <laughs> and, yeah, I mean, if that isn't going to scare you, I don't know what it is, to be honest. So fear of future in general, this is a slightly different track, so this isn't, necessarily this is more of a sort of further future future of the continent maybe sort of far future of people's lives type track and this is something that affects a lot of my characters but probably because trauma but you know this is something that definitely bothers Kony because again he was born in a war during a war so 
if I mean, if those are your earliest memories, it's pretty hard to not see that, especially with the continent being unstable. I mean, his lifetime, the continent is really quite unstable. Like, there is a period of more stability, but he just is not alive to see that. He hasn't been born yet. So his memory of the continent is that it's very unstable. He was born during a war. War is what he sees in the future. And, I mean, that... For him, it's not just a one-on-one -on -one nation thing, because he is, again, he's involved in politics. He's a diplomat. That's his job. He sees tension between this person and that person and just everywhere. And, yeah, he's just not really sure how to deal with that at all. And Curtis is actually very similar on this one. He very much fears that. And again, fears... Curtis is kind of difficult with this one, because being a king is not necessarily something he wants, but it's something, you know, he has to do. He doesn't really have a choice on that. But he also doesn't have a choice on eventually giving that up. And he doesn't know whether he'll have anybody to trust to take over when that time comes. And that is something that does really scare him, especially for, you know, his entire childhood, living through a period where Malzo is not doing too well. And knowing there have been two civil wars for Malzo and history, and it's quite a big burden for him. And Helga does also very much fear the future, so there is a whole, you know, genocide thing. But even beyond that, it's like, okay, but, you know, there are people who try to genocide the Hukis. There are people who are trying to genocide the South Yorvans. And whether they succeed or not, does that matter? Because it's just going to keep happening again and again and again, where does it end? You know, is at the end of the day, is this just how this land is going to be? That it's just going to be genocide after genocide until nobody's left? And that's a question I'm not sure even I can answer, because I, I don't know. <laughs> I think Shinichi fears a very similar thing. Uh, to Kony and Helga, in the sense that, okay, but where where do the attempted genocides end? But also, where do the wars end? Because that it's a land that's been riddled by war. Because, you know, obviously the downfall is the big one, but Malisar, since the downfall, Malisar have had two civil wars. They've been at war with Soleil. Harith and Soleil have been at war. Hukai and Safiordwick have been at war. It just doesn't really seem to end. And Hanzo very much, again, has exactly this of okay, but I mean, especially for him having been so directly involved in the war, when does it end? When does. When is there ever going to be stability? And I think for Hanzo in particular, because he was so instrumental in the war, in Hanzo just trying to hold shreds of things together. And one of the fears that Hanzo has is, you know, how he isn't going to be around forever. And when somebody needs to do that again, A, is he, if he's there, is he going to be capable? And B, well, if he's not there, who then takes up that mantle? And I, again, very similar to Sunichi, just doesn't, and again, having worked in politics as well, doesn't necessarily see an end to all of the turmoil that this land has gone through. Everybody's having fun. So, let's change tack again. Good God, this is a chunker. Let's talk about fear of authority. 
because this is something that affects both Coney and Curtis, and not really anybody else. And again, with Coney, some of his actions might speak against that in Pentaman, but I do think this is I's influence on him. Coney does very much grovel to his superiors. If somebody's not a direct superior, that might be slightly different. But if someone is higher than him in social status, whether that's true or whether that's what he perceives, again, he's he's a people pleaser. He he bows to them. He is constantly terrified that someone is going to order his execution. That's kind of the deal. So if he doesn't if he doesn't behave the way he does, then if he pisses off an authority figure, what's to stop them doing that? I guess is the deal. And Curtis also very much has a fear of authority, but this is past trauma, I don't know that I can talk about without huge spoilers in the sense that he he knows if he slips up the consequences are dire and this isn't something that is just for him as a prince either as alluded to earlier this is also okay but if he makes a really big blunder as king you know the whole civil war thing is not necessarily off the table like nobody wants that really. But if push comes to shove, the Malisons aren't that afraid to do it. So the fear of like laws in particular, and really this only stems from the one specific law to Hukai of, you know, we execute the gays here. <laughs> That's really what I'm talking about. And this affects, you know, most of my characters in a lot of ways, though some of them sort of are sort of blindly faithful that it'll never happen to them for whatever reason. So Coney, this is absolutely like number one most terrifying thing for him and it is why he grovels to authority figures so much. I've probably mentioned it enough in this episode already. That is absolute something he's absolutely terrified of. And Haru is very much the same, and this is something that does grow for him a bit as he gets older as well. There is a particular incident he has that really makes him rethink a lot of what he is doing, and it changes him. It changes his behaviour quite a lot. And Hanzo does have a fear of law, though not. Not necessarily that law. It does obviously bug him, but Hansel doesn't have to worry about it quite so much as some other people for reasons I don't think I can give without spoilers. Hansel's main fear in law is the treason thing because, you know, he has committed treason on more levels than one and the thought of people finding that out, even though to him it's sort of like, well, okay, I can commit treason, or like we can fall victim to another genocide, so... Again, he's got very valid reasons <laughs> that you can't really argue against, but... um, And I, when it comes to the executing the gays law, is kind of... He has mixed feelings on this, because obviously he could very easily fall foul of it, but at the same time, I is married. So on the one hand it terrifies him, but on the other hand it's like, well I'm married, so they can't really accuse me of shit. It's more that this kind of plays into the fear of loss with I of okay, but what if these other people I love fall foul of this? So then at long last, but certainly not least, we're going to talk about Fear of failure. And for a compendium called The Determined Ones, you'd expect this to bother every character. But it doesn't. It doesn't really bother Coney because his project doesn't really work in the same way. But it bothers everybody else. 
Curtis is probably number one on this list. I mean, I've alluded to this many times about, you know, the whole if he is not a good king, then civil war kind of deal. That's the main thing for him. With Haru, with, you know, trying to change the whole execute the gays law thing, if he fails on that, then again, it's the, okay, but if I don't do this, who will? When does this ever end? But also, it really stops Haru from getting what he wants out of life as well. And I is exactly the same on that if he doesn't succeed. For I and Haru it's very much if we can't do this then really is there anybody who can because expertise as much as anything. Haru is a human rights specialist. If he can't push through a change on a human rights basis given that human rights is just not a field that people go into. Who the hell is going to do that? And Hanzo very much has the fear of failure thing as well for all sorts of reasons, be that, you know, during wartime, you know, if I fail, then everybody dies. So, you know, failure is just not an option. But later on as well, I mean, Hanzo has a weirdly protective streak in the sense of he just wants to make sure nobody else has, nobody goes through what he's gone through and if he fails at that then that means a lot of people are getting very very hurt and he doesn't want that he would deny vehemently that he's a caring man <laughs> he kind of likes the snarky bastard reputation but he is caring now, Helga as well, I've alluded to this, if she fails, people die. And, like, not a few people, a lot of people. And same again with Shinichi, although Shinichi is a bit more of a um, tie to the land as well. Shinichi does very strongly feel connected to the land of Yukai, so it's not just that people would die is also that they'd lose their ancestral home and his ancestral home and his land, their land, and that that upsets him as a concept. And again, for someone like Isamu, if he doesn't succeed in what he's doing, he's not really sure what the consequences would be, I think is the deal with him. I don't necessarily want to state what his goal is. If he fails, the consequences are not clear. This could result in, you know, massive civil unrest, masses of, you know, potential deaths, or just, you know, complete political stagnation, or just, you know, who knows? Just, it could be all, all of that at once plus more. Like, it's, it's potentially really quite catastrophic and it, the consequences would not stay in Hukai either. It would spread internationally. And... <sighs> I can't wait to get to a sound project. I really can't. I think it's going to be really, really, really fun. But I believe that is about the end of this episode. It is a chonker, so props to you if you've stuck through the whole thing. Um, There are going to be more episodes like this. I don't know whether this is the first or not, we'll see. So keep your eyes peeled. The best way of making sure you don't miss it is to subscribe, really, that's the deal. If you are also looking for a way to find out when the next episode of this or the series is in advance, the best way to do that is to follow me on Instablam. That is really the podcast home. I announce episodes in advance of when they go up. You get soundbite teaser reels and other things and all sorts of stuff like that. <laughs> other things and all sorts of stuff like that. <laughs> Classic. <laughs> so if you want to find the podcast home, that is jade underscore black 21 on Instagram. If you're looking for the home of my writing, that is Twitter, jadeblack21. And last but not least, if you are published or on the way, please do get in touch. I think I usually do this the other way around, but I will. <laughs> 
jade42black at gmail.com if you're looking for an interview. There are things I want to know in advance, so please read the description, find out what that is, put it in your initial email. I don't want to give automatic no's if and when I get inundated, because that's no good for anybody. Uh, other things I should mention, doesn't have to be adult. I exclusively write adult, but that doesn't mean anybody else has to. It'd be interesting to talk about other things and hear how other people approach that. Doesn't have to be any particular genre for the same reason. Doesn't have to be a novel. Again, for the same reason, I'd love to have somebody on talking about a short story collection. Just whatever, just bring it in. If it's cool and you want to talk about it, bring it in. And that's about all for now. I think. I've probably missed something in a plug somewhere, but that's how this is a problem. <laughs> so, you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you for listening. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider subscribing so you don't miss future content. Copyright J Blank 2023.